Good evening, Rashawn. It's so nice to see you. How has it been this um, Saturday in Memphis? Uh, it's okay. Uh, try to keep warm. So uh, just other than that, man, everything been going well. Going well. It's um, it was sunnier at least today in Northwest Arkansas. Have would you did you experience the same like icy situation the past week that we had here? Uh, not really. Uh, it cleared up. Uh, I guess that the next day. I think it started Thursday. Cleared up around Friday. Everybody was out just driving around. Uh, okay, you're very fortunate then um, that it's just cold. I will like make confession moment. I have not opened the door behind me, my front door since Tuesday. It's just been too cold and too icy. Um, so I kind of feel like I need to get back to Memphis right away to a slightly better situation. Um, I'm so glad to get to experience a bit of Memphis's art scene today though, through you and through your work. Um, so for those of you who have not um, met Rashawn, this is Rashawn Pennister, visual artist, currently grad student as well in the Memphis area. Um, I'm really excited to get to know more about you and your work today, Rashawn, and kind of your journey to this really exciting point in your career. So thank you so much for being here. No problem. So we'll start in the beginning. Um, I'd love to know, Rashawn, a bit more about your life as a kid. Where were you growing up? What did you care about? And when did this idea of being an artist kind of become something that you claimed for yourself? Okay, so uh, Carl, I was uh, from, from Palm Bluff, Arkansas. Um, it was like when I was young, I pretty much grew up around like uh, comic books, cartoons, manga, all that stuff. So uh, I remember when I was, I guess, four or five years old, I was in County Market and I went to the comic section and I like saw this comic book. And uh, I believe the my first comic book was I believe my mom bought my X-Men comic book. And when I was young, I really didn't know how valuable, valuable that comic book was. So I was just a kid. So I was just experimenting, didn't know. And, but as I got older, I guess when I was six to seven, that's when I really liked comic book. I just love the visual effects of superheroes, such as Superman, Batman, and other, like other superhero groups like the X-Men, the Avengers. And it really, um, just wowed me. Like, I just like those, gra those flat graphics, sequential art. Uh, also, I like to play video games. Like, the video games, that definitely kept me occupied. Like, um, I wasn't those kids. I, I go outside most of the time, but when it comes to video games and comic books, I'm right there. Like, once you give me those, you don't have to worry about me, you know, disturbing you, getting in trouble and all that. That just kept me in line. Um, as, I, as I got older, um around junior high and high school that's when I started but you know got, got serious art I was drawing like ink like um like the comic books and everything and it, it pretty much uh motivated me to you know hey like let me start drawing and I just started drawing uh, I didn't take art seriously until I got to junior high because that's when we had art um actually visual art classes till we got in junior high and uh, I remember taking it like in seventh grade. And that's when I learned about the important stuff like the one point, two point perspective, uh, shading and all that. And like the first time shading, I like I just shaded everything with one value, just everything dark. And we think like, oh man, that's great. Like we really didn't even know about the difference between like light shading or dark, like the light value and dark value. We just, just color everything in like pencil. And we thought that was cool. <laughs> um, and around that time, I think when I was like in seventh grade, I think Dragon Ball Z was like oh, very yeah. popular. And me and my friend, who just uh, compete with each other, see who 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 uh, can draw better, who could draw the best, and we would just draw like who could draw the best Dragon Ball Z character. And I think around eighth and ninth, that's when we got serious by trying by drawing other subjects such as landscapes or portraits of real people or just shoes and. Um, I believe that ninth grade that was my first time I, I actually put my drawing into an art show and I got something off of it. I, I was like really wild by it. So then I got to high school and I kept going and I kind of laid off of it uh, my junior and senior year because I was in football ROTC and during that time my skills were conflicted with field of art so I couldn't take it. But instead I just, you know, did art on my le leisure time, free time. Uh, it wasn't until I graduated from high school that 
I want to pursue art. So um, I, <clears throat> I applied to UAPB and that's where I got my bachelor's of art. That's so cool. Oh my gosh, it's so, I think, fun to look back and see where the pieces kind of connect together that end up at that final point or, you know, not even the final point, just like the next point or the point that's a few points later. There's a few things that stood out to me too that I'm curious to um, go down a few little like rabbit holes with. The one of them was you talked about um, you know, Dragon Ball Z and you and your friends competing to have like the best Dragon Ball Z drawing. I'm curious about what best meant to you at that point. Like, right, you know, if we look at your work now, it's not like totally literal, right? The colors are not the, the colors of the real scene. Did, was that different for you at that time? Like, what were you trying yeah, to uh, the Dragon Ball? <laughs> yeah, it was it was different. It's like, um, we was, we really, like I said, Dragon Ball Z, but we really, that's when we really got into manga and like man uh, anime and manga mm -hmm. and when um we come to when we come to school we'll show our drawings like and to us the best was like how good it looked like the details in it um the details the shading like soon we started getting good with our shading uh like from light to dark and that's how we was able to like see like oh man and so far it was like it took me a minute but as i kept practicing on my shading, kept practicing it on adding details. That's how that's that's how I got better. I just looked for those details. It took me a minute, but once I got it and kept practicing, I was just getting better. Oh, that's awesome. I so appreciate like the chance to understand what that was like better for you. Um, you also mentioned superheroes and caring a lot about those at different points in your life and then manga and these different things. I assume dragon, I think they all have their own type of kind of superpowers and this is nothing to do with art or maybe it does, but I want to know like your ideal superpower um, if you could have one. <laughs> um, <laughs> ooh. That's a great question. Um, probably super strength, you know. There you go. Like, yeah, super super strength or the ability to maybe copy other superhuman strength, like super. I'm sorry, superpower beings. That way, I can you know be toe to toe with them. <laughs> I feel like that's like next level thinking. Like you have to know your superheroes to know that that's going to be the best thing <laughs> for you to have. That's really cool. Um, so I appreciate you kind of having that aside with me. The other thing you mentioned that struck me, I love the chance to learn a different term that I'm not familiar with. You mentioned one point and two point something or other in your art classes in middle school. What the heck is that? Like, so, okay. So the one point perspective is where, um, how do you say it? so in your paper, um, this is how people sometimes draw like the like landscape like looking towards you. So the one point perspective is that everything goes to that point, like in the middle of the paper. And then we have a two points perspective. It pretty much, that's when you kind of like see like the sit, like like a like a row of buildings on the on one side and a roll of buildings, a roll of another building on another side. So they're looking towards you like that. So that, that's that's what I was talking about. That's so cool. I just think that next time I'm walking around a museum or a gallery and I see one of those perspectives, I'm going to think of you, Rashawn, and I'm also going to be able to tell the person I'm with if I'm with anyone like that's one point perspective. And I know that from my friend Rashawn. So thank you for making me wiser um, in this space. So you went through your school and you went to UA Pine Bluff. Um, you worked in realistic art at that time. Was that kind of your focus or what was that period? you know, about for you? Uh, that period was like really, you know, pretty much mastering uh, my skills, like definitely work on my craftsmanship, definitely work on my values, like from light to darkness. And um, <clears throat> it started like when I took uh, a still life drawing class where we draw from still life. And that was like my first time literally drawing. I must say, I wouldn't say my first time, but that was my first time ever taking something that serious. Like usually I'll look at something and just copy it, but actually looking at it from that, like looking at it, actually seeing the light hitting the object, seeing which side is lighter or which side is darker and really adding in the details, that that really kind of wowed me. And, and uh, my professor, he really was breaking it down. Miss Lynn would like break it down with the, what's important, what's important. Like instead of some people like will go do the details and not worry about the values and when and that's when he showed me that that's the first thing you gotta look for is look for the, where the light is coming from 
which side is darker and go for the values and, you know, draw, you know, have your drawing loose, you know, cause you're always going to make mistakes and you always need to go back and correct it. And that's how you get better. So it started from there. Um, then after that, um, I learned, <clears throat> I took some 3d classes and that really caught me off guard. Cause that was my first time actually taking three dimensional and thinking outside from a flat 2d perspective from 3d. And then after that, that's when I got into painting, um, actually painting still life. And that was a whole nother level. Drawing was one thing, but actually adding colors, that was that really was an eye-opening experience. Yeah. Because like as, as kids, you know, we look at paint, you just want to just go crazy. But, at, but as you get older and start, you know, learning about the values, learning about um, the shapes and the form and everything, how, it take, how everything takes a takes a hold when you're making a painting that's when you have to look at it that's when you have to practice oh my gosh so um I think it's I can resonate with so many parts of this like learning experience for you and you're it sounds like your mind was being open to just like the expansiveness of this field that you were entering I'm similarly in school right now I'm in grad school and I think when I entered, um, I had this idea that I kind of knew everything already. I was like, oh, this is just going to like check a box for me. I'm going to have this degree. It's going to tell people that I know these things that I already know. And then I get there and I'm like, I, there's so much I don't know. And I really need to be here. And I'm going to gain so much from being in this space. Um, I wondered if that resonated with your experience at all, or like what your frame of mind was like, as all this new stuff was kind of um, entering your brain and you were having to learn how to use new tools. Um, the thing about it, about art is that it's universal, like it's, it's important to be exposed. As long as you're exposed, that's the thing, it's exposure. And once you're exposed to it, it's like you're going to, you're going to gain a little of it, but as you practice, the more you practice, the more you gain, the more experience you gain. So the big, the most important part is exposure because once you're exposed to it, you may, you know, may not work on that for maybe a couple of days a week, but one day when you go through it again, it's going to resonate like, oh, I remember this. And then if you definitely take a liking to it, you're going to keep working on that until you get better. So it's kind of like, you know, taking, uh, how you say it, like taking a bite out of an elephant. I guess that old saying, you know, <laughs> one piece at a time. And that's what art is. You just, you just mastering or you're studying one piece at a time. Like maybe uh, your first, your first does maybe like learning how to draw the shapes or the form of, a, of an object. Then step two, learning how to shade, where the light is hidden or where it's dark. And then step three, add in the details and then go from there. And, and then that's how you do it. Like you might, like your first painting might be a rough draft your second painting might be better. You know, you're looking for those little details, like those little improvement, maybe a big improvement, maybe a small improvement, but that's what you're looking for. You're looking for some kind of improvement. Yes, um, that ability to stick with something, I think through all of those iterations to the point of like realizing the skill that you're trying to hone, I think is um, a powerful thing in and of itself. I think a lot of people may be um, get discouraged or get frustrated in the process rather than continuing to show up. Um, so I think that, I mean, that's wonderful the way that you were able to keep yourself like motivated and seeing that big picture um, and like normalizing that we do have to go through these hurdles to get to the point that we want to be. Did you know back then, back then could have, I don't actually know how long ago you were in undergrad. It could have been recently that you were going to go to grad school at some point in the future or did that become part of your story later? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think, let's see. Um, my first year at UAPB uh, doing at the art department, um, my professor was talking about like, that's like the next step. Like, what's your next step? Uh, either you're going to be an art teacher, you're going to, or you're going to, you know, be an artist, or you're going to continue education and go to grad school. And at first I thought grad school was for, you know, people that want to teach art, you know, they want to teach art in college. And, you know, I'm like, I'm really not a, <laughs> at first I'm like, I'm really not a social person. I really don't like being around, you know, kids and students and, you know, 
all that and everything. So my junior, my junior senior, um, my professor called me and he was gonna ask me like, what's my future? Like what, what I'm gonna do next? And um, we, when I was telling him, when we was talking, you know, he said, you ever thought about going to grad school? And I was like, man, I really don't wanna just, you know, teach. And he definitely told me about, there's more to that, you know, you, you know, you can do other things, you know, any, and um, other than being like in a public school set, you also gonna be like an adjunct professor and all that. And I'm like, oh, so I kept doing research and all that and I applied. And unfortunately, my senior year, I didn't get in. So, but I, I didn't give up, I just kept applying. And last year I got accepted and I went ahead and took it and applied here at the University of Memphis. That's so cool. I think another just like um, example of your resilience in your story and that persistence coming through and, and making um, a difference. I'm curious about, okay, so I'm, I've been reflecting a lot on the grad school experience lately because I'm in my last semester and I can remember, you know, back to the application process, right? We kind of had to have a, vision, at least in the social work world, of like what we wanted to do with the knowledge that we would have the chance to learn. Did you have to know at that point kind of like your, what your style of art was going to be? Or, you you know, I think eventually maybe you talked about having an artistic view of social issues. Did you know that going in? Did you have to have that vision before you got there? Or is that something that became part of your story later? I think, I think um, the application um, was kind of different. Um, because the one thing they're looking for is portfolio. They're looking for something. I, I think they're seeing like um improvements in your work, or if you can do like a, a series. And um, I think they it's, just, it's like each I think each department is looking for something. So for us, for artists, they're looking for a great portfolio. They're looking for a uh, a great statement of purpose, and also they're looking at your resume to see. Um, what kind of experience you have, whether you, you um, doing your undergrad, have you worked in a workshop? Have you did, have you a workshop helper? Or have you worked in the gallery, has an experience in the gallery? Or maybe, you know, maybe you had some experience with your artwork being accepted in a jury exhibition. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, I think it's like some small criteria to that, but I think the biggest one is your portfolio. They want to see, you know, what kind of work you know, your work a series of it is drawing or painting. See how, I guess, like, first, how versatile you are. Yeah, that makes sense. So in that time, then, I guess, when you were preparing to apply again, what kind of, like, what was that growth like for you? How did you kind of come at it from a different perspective? Uh, definitely just, you know, working on different, painting different subjects. Like, I mean, it's the one paint, paint different subjects, but working on different subjects, maybe like added on, instead of like just painting, like what if I work on other mediums or what if I add other mediums to my painting to make it a mixed medium? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, a mixed media and go from there. And I think that's what got me into the University, I mean, <clears throat> University of Memphis is, you know, I guess the way, the way I was being versatile, like I was just learning something new and I was just adding on and on to it. That's so cool. I think that, um... I like to believe at least the timing often works out the way that it is, you know, hopefully, you know, best suited for us. And so even though probably it wasn't your first, you know, desire to go later, it seems like you were able to have some cool outcomes in your versatility from it being a delayed sort of start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like um, the one thing that uh, was, was like, I think what really shocked me was the simple fact that you know how quick they uh emailed me to let me know that they accepted me I'm like wow like I'm thinking like like oh they gonna get back with me like maybe in April or something uh they I think the deadline was like somewhere around February and I think around March or the last week of February they said I just had an email say hey congratulations we we accept you you've been admitted I was like wow so I was I was like wow and happy that you know I got admitted uh, admitted and I was able to, you know, start a new chapter. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful like affirmation of, you know, the hard work that you had put in and um, that like dedication to this goal. Um, so I, I can imagine how exciting that would have been to be in your shoes on that day in March uh, when that acceptance came in. That's so cool. Um, I think that 
I would love to, um, you know, kind of segue a bit to understand your style and your approach to um, your work. I kind of touched on this before, but in, I think on your website, maybe you describe having an artistic view of social issues. Can we start there maybe with what that means for you? Um, so I guess what it is is that um, lately I just been doing like artwork that I want people to like, like socialize when you look at it. I want them to like, you know, relate to the artwork to let them know that, you know, portraitures has evolved since, you know, the dawn of time. Like usually back, like in, back in the time, portraits was pretty much referred for the elites or somebody very important. So it's, it was, it was uncommon for us, a regular person to have, to be either be included or have that portrait made. So that was something that, that wowed me um, how, you know, a lot of people didn't really get portraits done, but, you know, luckily cameras can't, you know, they'll have a picture, but when it comes to portraits, that's like only reside for the elites. So I was like, wow. So my uh, approach to that is that I want people to know that, hey, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, having your portrait painted or, you know, hey, this person isn't an elite. This person is just a regular person, just like you and me. So it's like it's like making that connection to people. Like, hey, like anyone, anyone can be up here. You know, it does, it does, this is just a, a regular person, just like you. Yeah. Oh, that's so powerful. And I um like I had not really thought about it from that perspective of art history, but that's so valid. Yeah. Um. And uh, I picked it up because uh, I was um. I believe I was uh, listening to Kahende Wiley and how he talked about how, what he do and how, how he uh, how he express or communicate message to his viewers and how he paint his models in poses that uh, powerful people such as Napoleon and other rulers or king kings was like posing. So he would just get people out out the streets, just random strangers, and he would just you know talk to him, show him work, and he will invite them to his uh, studio and have them pose in these powerful forms. And then when you look at his pictures, you know, they're just regular people. And I'm like, wow, that's that's really powerful. So I'm like, like, why don't I do that? Why don't I just make uh, portraits of people that I know, like family, friends that I know, and just, you know, show people that, hey, like, these people are just like you. Yeah. Oh, I think that, um, you know, that must have been such a cool, like, moment when that idea popped into your head or maybe as it evolved over time um that would have so special to experience how much of your like story in art is portraiture based like is this a very recent development for you or has it ha been portraiture has been your jam for a long time uh it's, it's it's been it's been my thing for a minute was um so you mentioned like you were reading about or learning about Kehinde Wilde. Was that, am I pronouncing their name right? Kehinde Wilde, yes, yes. Kehinde Wilde. Um, were you reading about that through school or, you know, just like personal kind of stuff? What what was going on? Uh, pretty much. Uh, I definitely um, heard, about him, heard about him. So definitely through the internet. And now I, I watch, you know, some of his uh, documentary on YouTube and how he talks and everything, how he talks about his, his style, his approach. And uh, that's when um, I was looking at other artists. And one of the artists that really, you know, I guess, I believe that really caught my attention, that really kind of started me in my first series and I'm, I'm, I'm doing my undergrad was um, Henry Martis when he um, did portraits in unique colors. And when I uh, looked at his his um, paintings of how he did this one lady where uh, in the background, it was like a lot of colors. And I'm like, wow, so why don't, why don't, why don't, don't <clears throat> why don't I create portraits instead of using just the, our skin color, why don't I use colors based off that people personalities? Yeah, and so it's, it's, it's kind of like the oppressionism. And during that time, Harry, Henry Martis and other artists was responsible for this movement called the Farism movement, where they use colors, like bright colors. And I was like, man, I definitely, like, it, it just, like, it just caught on. So the more colors, I would, I would, like, experiment on, like, what kind of colors can I use in this background? And as I did research on the color theories, 
I found out that each color is, uh, is based off personality. So yeah. I was like, okay, why don't I paint them in, you know, on the colors that's based on their personalities. That's so cool. I think that um, that's also a really like epic evolution of portraiture. I think of like, um, you know, recently Crystal Bridges had this exhibit on American waters or something. And when you did a portrait of a ship captain, you'd put like little accessories in the background to tell you kind of that person's story. I feel like in your portraiture and what you're describing with these colors is like, you're also using these subliminal kind of cues like the color representing personality to share their story. And that's um, so special and like, just like so um, follows suit from history, but also kind of expands it and brings it to the future. And um, that's amazing. I'm glad we get to experience that in your work. Um, you also, I think when we were getting to know each other, you brought up another artist, Nick Gentry. How does his inspiration with maybe floppy disks in the artwork like how does that kind of fit into your story so my my latest series uh i'm using playing cards so um before that happened i was uh, looking at his artwork and i liked how he would just take floppy disks which are um uh, almost like literally obsolete so he will take that and he will stack them um together to to further he'll stack them together and then he will paint on them these portraits and I was like man that's that's amazing I was like wow so he, he took something that was obsolete and used it as a mean uh inter <clears throat> use it as a mean of art so one day I was in Dollar Tree and I saw these unused I'm sorry correction I saw these used playing cards and you could tell they were used because when you open up the pack uh the edges was clipped off so I guess that was something uh I guess the casino used that as a way of saying that these these are are used so I guess not to use them no more to dispose of them. So, so I guess that just disposing of them, throwing them away, they just give them to uh, the Dollar Tree and sell them for a dollar. So I, I was thinking like, man, what if I use the same approach as Nick Gentry, but uh, but use it in my way. Yeah. So uh, my first couple attempts, I would like stack the cards together and then I would draw on them. And um, at first, you know, at first, like just thinking that way, I was like, uh, I guess, I guess this ain't gonna work. And then um, I was like, what if I draw the figure and cut them out? Draw, draw the figure, cut them out to form the subject, and then have them, and then put them on a canvas or put them on a a sheet of paper and then put them in a background to have that kind of effect. And ever since then, I just ran with it. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Um, no, I love, you know, you, how like playing cards fit into your story and we'll definitely um, go through that as well. But I appreciate you explaining that connection to Nick Gentry. You said too, like just now, kind of like you had this epiphany, it worked and you've gone from there. Um, you've talked before about, you know, being a fan of sequential art and being a fan of sequential art, I think, in your own practice. Can you tell me about, you know, well, I, I can tell, I guess, from the word what sequential art is, but really like what it means to you and, and why it's important to you. Uh, so sequential art is pretty much like, um, in my in my terms, uh, kind of like the most of the art that you see, like in comic books, manga. So it's like flat. So it's not like 3D, like where it just pop out to you. Everything's flat, like the background, foreground, middle ground, just flat. And the only way you can tell the background, foreground, middle ground, pretty much like the landscape and all that is due to like the, the values, like the light and dark. But it's, it's, it's just flat. It's not like realistic, kind of like what you see right here. Everything just flat. And I, and I, I like, the reason why I like the country art because I don't know. I just like flat colors. Like it's like everything's together. Everything just fits together. Um, and I just like the lighting and I like the how it's just the, the flat color just uh, illuminate to me. That's so cool. I actually had the wrong definition in my head. I was thinking of like series and sequential art being the same thing, but I'm so glad to know yeah, it's yeah. like a different part of what makes your work um, special. So thank you. So yeah, yeah. Also like sequence, like you see, like it, it tells you a story. Like sometimes like the comics, how it tell you the story, but it also have the, like the flat, like that, it's like the flat colors. 
but it's a sequence where it tell you from the start, I guess like how everything start and then go from from start to the end. So that's amazing. So that's 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 another thing. It's like it tell you a story, and it's like you reading it, you're trying to figure out what the story is about, and only way you can tell is by maybe the action of what's going on, or maybe luckily each comic book will have a plot. Will tell you who the person is, um, what's the, what's the story is about. Uh, kind of have like an intro, and then you can go read from there, or you can read like what the characters are saying through the bubble, through the um, what's those things called the uh, um, the text bubble, <laughs> yeah, the text yeah. bubble. You can tell what their story is and all that. And um, it just, I just liked it. It just kept me occupied. Like, and it's different. Like when you look at it, you can understand what the story is compared to like trying to read it and trying to guess what it, what the book is about. And, uh, and like when I was young, it's like, I kind of like didn't, I kind of despise of it. Cause like, it's this big old, this wide big book about 100, 200 pages. And you're reading it, you're trying to figure out what it's about because I'm so used to like reading comic books. So I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, I see a 200 page book. I'm thinking like, okay, they're going to be like 200 pages of pictures. And I can <laughs> understand it, but no, yeah. it's words. So now that's a whole different level of thinking. So you're reading and you're trying to guess what the story is. And uh, at first um, I really wasn't getting the hang of it, mm -hmm. but as I kept practicing and practicing and reading, reading aloud and reading along with my teachers, I was able to get the, get a hang of it. That's so cool. I think that we get to come from it, you and I, from like these opposite perspectives. Like if I see a book of 200 pages of pictures, I'm like so frustrated because I'm like, what the heck is happening here? I don't get it. Like I need the words and you on the, are on the opposite side of like, I need the pictures. What I think is so powerful in your work is that like you do show up with the picture, but when I get to sit here with you and have this kind of chance to know your story, now I get the inside scoop of like what is happening um, in your own sort of take on sequential um, art and, and how your story kind of plays into it. So um, it brings me back to the playing cards that we were talking about just a moment ago um, and kind of what those mean in your family and in your history, um, kind of broader than the dollar store where you got that one deck. So, um, the, so the reason why I started using playing cards is because one, um, like playing cards, like pretty much been like, like my number one thing, like when it comes like the family get together, like when my grandma was alive, um, we would always have get togethers at her house, uh, whether it's like a holiday or just a, just a regular weekend where we just could get together and cook and everything. They would always put out the playing cards, like my mom, my aunts, my uncles, they would just, they, they would just play cards. And I remember them like playing cards all the way from the sun up to the sundown. Like I remember one time they was playing, like it was like late, late at night. Like we were supposed to be in bed and <laughs> they were just still playing. It was like, oh, I guess we, I guess they're gonna play until the sun comes up. And um, and that's when uh I got into learning about space and other playing games. I mean, I'm sorry, playing card games. And um, and just a simple fact how one game can really bring people together and socialize. So as um, so as I was like just thinking about it, I also think about during that time, you know, all this stuff was going on with the uh, Black Lives Matter, Matter, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the George Floyd incident, Breonna Taylor, and all that, and how you know how we came a long way. How you know something like this back in the day, you know, would I want to say would be hush hush, but what happened is like something happened that I think nobody expected was a lot of protests. Like a lot of people was like, especially a lot of people was fed up. And when it happens, you see like these movements, these protests, I'm like, oh, wow. At first you think it would happen in major cities, but it was happening everywhere. Not only here in the United States, it happened all like in other countries, like all the other people was like, was with it. And they was like, they were just, they were just tired. And everybody was like, enough is enough. Like wrong is wrong. Like what, what happened to George Floyd, what happened to Breonna Taylor, what happened to all these people is wrong. Like there gotta be some kind of, you know, consequences for this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was thinking about like, you know, we're playing the cards that we dealt with. And um, when I was teaching, I was, I was teaching uh, elementary art. 
I was talking with one of my coworker, um, and um, we was talking about, you know, we were about these kids, how they was, you know, in these environments where, you know, they seeing these things, they seeing crime, they seeing, um, you know, people that they know, family and friends that's, you know, either getting, going to jail or getting shot. So they're bringing that anger and that negative to school. And we're trying to tell them like, hey, this is a safe haven. You know, you don't have to be hostile. You don't have to be angry and everything. And we're just wondering like, man, like, like what's gonna be these kids future? What's gonna happen to them? And that's when she said, you know, you know, they just gotta play with the cards that, we, you know, we gotta play with the cards that we dealt with. And that's when I came up with the idea, like, you know, this is just pretty much like the black experience, the black experience, like we're just playing the cards we dealt with as our ancestors was taken from Africa, brought here to be slaves and as when slaves was abolished, it's like they have to start back. They have to gain something. They have to, uh, they have to pretty much like fight for their rights because a group of people didn't believe that they deserve their rights. And you know all that's going on, we still played the, the game. We still played the game of life. We still uh, kept fighting. We kept fighting for peace. We kept fighting for equality. We kept going. So that was the thing. Um, that's 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 why I was using playing card. I feel like. Life is a card game. You're going to get a good deck. You're going to get a bad deck. But you just got to keep playing. And once you, you get a good deck, I guess that's when you make a great choice or something good that happens in your life. You just play that hand. You just kept playing. Keep going. Keep going. Keep living. Yeah. Oh, I think it's um, it's so wonderful how this analogy and this thing of actual cards speaks on so many levels to your personal experience, to generations of people's experiences, um, and to like what can keep us moving forward to hopefully a better future. Um, because of, I think, I don't know, I'm thinking about like, when that great opportunity comes in any scenario, right? If you're not ready by having put in all the work and all the sweat equity leading up to it, then you're going to miss it, right? So even if you have a thousand bad decks, um, playing those bad decks, like doing what you can with them is what allows you to know what to do when a good deck come, comes around, right? Like just continuing to show up with those things. Um, I, I love that idea. And I think it's really inspiring to anyone who gets to interact with it. Um, it makes me think about one more kind of, you know, aside about your approach to your work before we get into the specific pieces that we have to show today. Um, you've talked about critiques as ideas and even like maybe posting your work on Instagram for feedback. I think that's a cool way that you, and, and maybe I'm reading into it the wrong way. So like, let me know if I am, but it seems like it's a cool way that you're taking um, a proactive action to like keep learning and growing. Can you talk to me about like what it feels to put yourself out there in that way and like how you've grown to kind of welcome feedback? Cause that's the thing that makes me personally very uncomfortable. Um, at first, like when I was young, I, you know, I really didn't like critique either. So, and it's, it's um, it's like a good, it's like a, 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 like a punch to the gut when someone said, you know, I, I, you know, I worked okay. It's not, it's, it's not all that, you know, I, I seen better. He's like, oh, wow. But as I got older, um, I remember, um, uh, Kevin Cole, he, he's an artist. He's uh, actually, um, alumni from UAPB and a, a really, a great artist, and he told me how a critique is. He said, it's, it's not about you, it's about your artwork. So it, 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 they're talking about your artwork, and I talk about you as a person. They just talk about your artwork. So my mom, like, that makes sense. Like, why I didn't think of that? Like, that do make sense. They're not talking about me. They just talk about my artwork, and they're just saying, hey, like, like, it's, it's this chance for you to get better. Like, you know, you know, everything's not gonna be perfect. So it's just a chance for you to get better. Like, um, maybe. I should add this color or uh, maybe I should add more value to that subject. And, and, and that's what, and that's what I did. And that's what that was, that's what it um, critiques do. It, it makes you better. It, it shows you that there are still room to improve. So as I post my work on Instagram, I mean, all the comments, you know, people just like my artwork, but at the same time, I also critique myself because I'm thinking like, if my artwork is great, I, I should get like a lot of, I should get like more likes. So, and I started seeing that as I getting better, I was getting a lot of likes from 10 to 20. Then all of a sudden I was getting like from 40 and it was just going up and up. So, and, and that was my goal was to get like at least enough likes to where maybe one day uh, a curator, someone would look at my artwork and hit me up on DM me and say, hey, we would like for you to uh, like to look at your portfolio to see 
if you got a chance to have an exhibition in our show. But at the same time, usually those processes, you just you just go to an exhibition and ask for an appointment and they'll see your artwork. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool though I think it's such a healthy perspective to like make the separation of the work and the creator of the work like that's really difficult but I think it's really worth kind of continuing to practice that skill um, because that feedback is absolutely what enables us to keep um, growing in this community of other like makers and doers who can share wisdom between each other so that's awesome um, now we won't be doing critiquing here we'll do a lot of celebrating but i'm going to pull up your work so that we can speak more specifically to um, some of the great things that you have made so far so this first one um is it so there's three um people's names in in the title right would could you pronounce them for me i don't want to get it wrong it's a so it's brie brie brianne like believe it or not they, they they're all like like they usually go by the same the same nickname breeze but uh, believe it or not, uh, it's Brie, Brie, uh, Brie and Brienne. Uh, but she go by Brie. So they all, they all go by Brie. So uh, this was during my undergrad year when I was um, um, doing a, <clears throat> my uh, show was called True Colors. And I was just doing a series of these portraits in different colors. And um, like I said, I was looking at artists like Henry Martis, who during that time was doing color portraits. And I was thinking like, man, this is why I was working with color, I was working with texture. And instead of me painting with uh, a paintbrush, I was using a painting knife. I will use a palette knife. And cause I wanted to get that textural feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, so how I came up with the, you know, painting with a palette knife, there was this artist, her name, she had a hard name, uh, Nelly Franska. And I was seeing, I saw her use these, but instead of her using acrylic, she would use oil. And I was like, no, nah, I'm gonna use acrylic because I need this to dry. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I don't need to work on it, you know, all week or a month. I need this to dry so I can move on to the next layer. Right. So I'll just, you know, paint layer and layer on top of the palette knife. And then sometimes I will go in the paint, use a paintbrush, to go in for the for the small details, but mostly is mostly um, palette. Uh, me using a palette line. So um, I was just going around asking like my my classmates, uh, like you know, hey, do you have time if I can take a picture of y'all and you know, um, you know, take a picture uh, of y'all? Like come to my studio so I can take a picture and pretty much you know use y'all as uh, in my paintings. And um, they agree. So uh, I decided to do these three. And what I did was I used Photoshop to combine these three in a, in a reference photo and go from there. And to put them on there, I used the grid method where I drew the grids on the canvas and then I'll draw the figures and then I will paint them. Wow. And then uh, I'll use like layers. I'll go, I was like, um, I would take a palette knife and I would just start painting. And then I would go back and add layers and layers of colors from light to dark. And, um, and then um, after that, then I would go and try to use a paintbrush and add in the details. So it's a long process. There's not just a, it's not a one and done kind of layer or step. There's quite a yes. lot going on beyond behind um, the scenes. But wow, the finished product thing is so like, breathtaking and you mentioned like color theory before I wondered like how that comes up here right like each um brie is a different shade yes. completely what's going on yes um so the so on, on the left brie the blue she she's uh quiet she's cool uh she's she's very quiet she really don't talk much but when she do talk you know it's it's cool um, she's friendly and all that. So I decided to use blue to show that cool perspective. Uh, the Brie in the middle, she's a very outgoing person. She's always cheering all that. She's, uh, she have a, a great smile and she's a very outgoing person. So that's why I use the color orange. And then like also use blue to reflect the other Brie uh, color on her hair. And then Brie on the right, uh, she's very, um, like I said, she's very outgoing, creative. Like she's somebody that you you like, 
Like she's really like one with nature. She's really cool and all that. And she's really uh, great to get along with. That's awesome. And I had taken for granted. I hadn't really appreciated that the hair was reflecting the color of the other two folks faces. Um, was that meaningful to you? Was it, you know, did it speak to kind of their kind of synergy or what was that about? Man, uh, so um, like I said, I've been like studying other artists who paint portraits and everything. Um, it's important that you kind of show that reflected light. And so I was like, man, like why don't I show like wherever, like you want to show that reflected light on whatever closest to them. So since uh, Brie, Brienne is on the right, her face is green. I said add a little bit of green to Brie who's in the middle. And then the other Brie was on the other side, her face is blue. So I decided to add that to give it that little, kind of like that, uh, pretty much that kind of reflected light. And I kept going because I think the thing is you want to have that kind of like that color balance. You know, like if there's a dark color on the left side, you want to add a little bit of dark color on the cool color, darker cool color on the right side, the same for vice versa. So it's kind of like a little color balance. Oh, that's amazing. That's so cool. I'm so glad to understand that better. So thank you. Um, so I'm thinking back to earlier in this conversation, you mentioned like when you first started dabbling in portraiture, you decided you'd go up to family and friends, right? And start asking them if you could, could depict them in this portrait kind of framework um is this a little bit later in your timeline like have you already been asking people a lot to do portraits when you do this work or is this like where does this fit in um I started this like during my uh undergrad and um like it was like a I said it was like one of those moments like hey why, why, why not I just do this you know like like that's I want to, like I'm thinking like why don't I ask my you know my friends my classmate can they just you know can I take pictures of them and post you know for them to post on me so I can get better at drawing portraits. What was that like? Some of the, I mean, and has there been changes in how you feel like now when you ask people to do their portrait versus like when you were in undergrad or early? Um. It's a little different because in undergrad, you know, I see these people every day. So uh, we'll either we'll take class together or we'll be, uh, or maybe around campus. So I see these people every day. So it was, it was nothing for, to me, I felt like, hey, why don't I just ask them since, you know, we kind of seen each other every day. And uh, it, yeah, it's like, okay, like, you know, like, what if, they, what if they say no? I'm like, well, if they say no, I can just find somebody else. So it was, it was like that, um, trial that trial and error you know like hey like you know I, I think they'll they'll be happy that someone an artist asked them you know can they paint a picture of them yeah I think that that framing of the situation and um in, in social work we think a lot about like challenging like the negative thought right like and remembering what that worst case scenario is which is just a no which is a step closer to a yes from some the right you know portrait muse whatever they may be um so I think that that's awesome um when you're um I'm kind of like just going a little bit on a rabbit hole again but I'm really curious about these like human interaction parts of the art so there's a moment in the beginning where you ask someone if you can paint them right or, or do something with you know a photo of them whatever do they also get to see the end work like did Brie Brie and Brie get to see this work yes they did uh they was they was able to um uh, i my when my show was uh, displayed at, at uapb they was able to come and they were like um uh, they'll come and say yo like this is amazing like i i've seen your work and it's great i like i appreciate that and they were just wild and amazed that at how i was able to complete it you know in that kind of um in that way, I guess they never seen something like that. They never seen like uh, layers and layers of paint just, you know, on, e on each other in that kind of textural form. Yeah. Are you, when you're making this work, when you're making any portraiture, are you thinking about what that person, how they might react to it later? Are you able to tune that out? Do you think it's important to think about that or important to ignore it? Or like, what is that like for you? Man, so one thing about portraits that you definitely want to get, I want to say every like 
I won't say anything perfect, but you definitely want to get like this, like the nose and pretty much the parts almost right, like the right. Um, how you say it? The words come to me. Um, you definitely want want to get it like right because if it's like off, then that person will look entirely different. Like it won't look like that person. And that's when you, that's when like I had to go back and, you know, correct it. Like, oh man, I got to correct this. And now that, I mean, you know, you, you can't, you know, it's hard to make a perfect painting, like real, like real list, like a realism painting, which that will take a long time, but you want to get like the facial appearance right. Like the space of the eye, the nose, and the mouth, like they kind of go together. If you can measure it, like the nose, usually the, uh, the ends of the, the lips is kind of lined up with the pupil of the eye. Yeah. Um, the, the nose is pretty much kind of like the end of the nose is lined up with the eyes. So it, it, it's kind of like measurements. That's wild. I like had taken all of those things on my face for granted, but now I'm going to be looking in the mirror and seeing if my eyeballs <laughs> line up to the ends of my it, lips. It, it's it's kind of, well, um, sometimes like, fo like photo, like when you take a picture of someone and when you use a ruler to try to like match what was what like aligned with each other, the, the alignments and everything, you actually will see it. That's so crazy. I'm, I can't wait to like take a closer look um, at myself, at my sister, at my parents and all that um, and appreciate more of the dimensions of our, of our facial features that you as a portraiture kind of person get to account for in the day to day. Um, so I love this one. I'm really glad we got to talk about it. Um, the next one is patience and being calm. They're two separate works, right? And I think that their dimensions are not the same, actually, that maybe the one on the right is smaller than the one on the left. Um, but I can't wait to hear more about this one and and I and start to talk about kind of the cards coming in because I see them here. So the one on the left is patient. That's like my first big work. Like I'm gonna say big work. Well, I mean my big work, I mean that's my forward that actually got me out there. Uh kind of got my art, my name locally out there in the art world in Arkansas. Um, so this was the first one where I said, what if I cut my cars and the pieces to form the subject. And I just was uh, was just playing around with it. So how I came up with the idea is, this is like a picture of my friend Mark and he was just posing with his hood. So I decided to draw it, you know, to draw him on there. Like my first uh, trial was I drew, I cut out the cars to like the fully cars, like they, it wasn't missing. And um, just the whole thing and see how that works out. And it, it, didn't, it didn't have the same impact. So then I said, okay, what if I cut out just basic piece of him just to show, barely show enough of him. And then to show it, I use these bright colors. I use like warm colors to show that face. And then the background would be like these lines. And it got like a lot of likes. And and my work got accepted into the Delta, the Delta exhibition. And in Arkansas, that's like one of the biggest exhibition to get your uh, jury exhibition to get in. And I had a lot of positive review. A lot of people came and said, like, wow, that's amazing. And I remember asking the security guard, I was like, like, um, which art, which art piece is your favorite? And she pointed at mine. I was like, wow, like that's that's something. And um, and also this this uh, work got bought by the Arts and Science Center, so that was that was like my my first time uh, having my work bought from uh, the Arts and Science Center because my goal was is like you know to have one of my artwork in their collections because that was like uh, a huge goal, which that was like my second uh, artwork, my second time having my artwork in a permanent collection. My first was having, my first was having my artwork bought by the Mosaic Templars. So that, that so it was, it was, so it was great. But uh, Mosaic Templars is in Little Rock and the Arts and Science Center in Pine Bluff. So having my artwork in a permanent collection in my hometown, in a museum, in a, in a Arts and Science Museum in my hometown, I think that was like an accomplishment for me.
Yeah, what a huge milestone and and celebration um, to get to have that recognition um, in the place that means a lot to you and where you've lived a lot of life and played a lot of cards or been around people playing a lot of cards. Um, I I love also the patterns in this like work, like the different dimensions of like there's just so much going on, but it's also so still. Like I um I'm curious about the titling of patients and and the different kind of patterns that are going on um, in the background? So um, so I, I call it patient because I was looking like, like I'm like, yeah, like he, he looked like he was waiting for something. So I'm like, he's waiting patiently for something. So that's why I named it patient because of the way his pose, like you give that look, like he's looking for something, he's waiting for something. And also like the patterns and the lines, it was like these freestyle, like it was like the freestyle lines. I'm like, man, why don't I just go and just draw these lines? And it kind of reminded me of looking at a motherboard, like a computer motherboard. And sometimes it looked like um, how like roads are so different. Like you, this road of life, like it's not a straight path. It's, it's, it's like a curvy path. It's, it's, a, it's like, it's, come, it's a pretty much intersecting with other, other paths of life. So I was just like, why don't I just take different colors and just draw lines and give this unique look. And looking at it now, it's like that kind of like, um, kind of like the F, like, um, how you say it? Uh, Afro futuristic kind of look. Cause I do, if you look up here, I was like doing like these intersecting lines. And sometimes, you know, if you look, sometimes you can find those patterns like in African textile, African, African clothes. Also, if you look real close, you also can see like sometimes kind of remind you like some like uh, technology of how like computers or how you say it, kind of like the computer or the internet or the super like the mother uh, super highway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like super highway, the internet and all that. So I just went along with that and it worked. It absolutely does. And are the colors here, are, are those chosen to convey something or do they just, you know, work well, or did you just feel those colors in the moment? I just, I just, I just like, I just like, warm, like bright colors, like warm, bright colors. And I just went along with that. It works. It's perfect. It's awesome. Um, so I'll do, redirect to the, the one on the next um, part of the screen. This is called Being Calm. What? Yeah, so um, so the first one, patient, it was a three by four painting. This one is so it's, it's a thirty six by forty eight. This one, no, I'm sorry, it's a, th a forty by thirty. This one is a eighteen, a eighteen by twenty four. So it's kind of like the same. Um, and this one right here is actually, I actually just drew this. This is a, just this is just a fictional person, and I just drew it. Uh. I, and so uh, if you look on the left, I use regular playing cards. This one is I use these jumbo, these jumbo size playing cards where they're bigger. And I decided to use them to see, you know, see how, you know, it work. And, and this one is, is that I will stack the cards up. I will draw the subject. I will cut it out. And then I will paint them and I will glue them on another surface. Wow, it's so cool. And um, the design that's happening in the background, is there like, is it spray paint or is it like, how is, okay, cause I'm, <laughs> that's what it looked like. Yeah, so uh, at first I will just, I just like, this is our work. I just keep continually, continuously working on it. So this is just like, a, just a continuous work of art. At first I spray painted, I had, a, I put a stencil. Before I glue the subject on there, I will like use, I will like um, use sten uh, stencils to spray paint different patterns on the paper to make these unique backgrounds. And then I will glue the picture on there. But what I decided to do is, is after I got done spraying the stencil, I would um, just, you know, just paint I'll like leave some of the, leave some of it untouched. And then I'll put the picture on there to get that unique background. 
it turned out so cool that like kind of contrast and how it all kind of fits together. Um, so this is special because it is a fictional character. It's someone who came out of your mind instead of the real world. And I'm curious about how your process was different when working with a fictional person versus a real person. Did you do some sort of like sequencing in your brain or storytelling around what was going on? I'm excited. To uh, not, not, not really. I will just... Um... Uh, I was just thinking like, man, like, let's see, what kind of, like, let's see, how would this person look? So I was just kind of like, you know, sketching, drawing it to see how would this person look, you know, if, uh, you know, if I just go by the looks, like maybe the nose or the eye, like maybe, the, like, what kind of, like, how the nose gonna look or how the mouth gonna look or how the eyes gonna look. So it was just like those, you no know, brainstorming moments. Yeah. Do you, are you finding that you get maybe more um, energized by the real characters or the fictional ones or having the a little, a little, a little bit of both, like 50, 50. Good to keep them both in the rotation <laughs> then. That's awesome. Um, so this one is called Fleeting Green. Um, I can't wait to hear more about this work. So uh, the reason I call it Fleeting Green, because, you know, life is fleeting and like that, and that's like the connection between uh, us and flowers is like we both have this sustaining life uh lifeline and where you know we live and we die so that's why i use the green color because green relates to nature and like i said this person uh I, I did a reference picture but then i decided to like change it up a little bit you know to afford a look you know for copyrights so uh, i changed up the nose the mouth the appearance and definitely the hair and at first I was like uh won't well, like at first I was like it was just gonna be green but then I said why don't I just add flowers to the background so it can relate so it, so the background and a subject can be one you know what like the relationship like why is the flowers with that person so that's how I came up with uh the fleeting green because flowers and nature and people are one together. Yeah, I love that even though the person's skin color and the wall are the same color, like you can absolutely distinguish the arm like from the wall and the face from the wall. Um, it also makes me think about, you mentioned being inspired by Kehinde Wiley, right? And um, their work, uses a lot of like like floral kind of elements is that yeah right? yeah it, it that does fun. and um and like so when I saw his work I was like man like that's a lot of flowers and then I'm like and I had these like I was just buying these stencils so when um I looked at stencil I said why don't I use flower like why don't instead of me you know drawing or painting all these flowers man why don't I just take the stencils and just use unique colors and that's 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 what I went with it turned out awesome. Um, I appreciate the chance to get to see kind of the finished product of that that thought process and experiment. And this is one of your more recent kind of ventures outside of one medium into another one, right? This is in the graphic design kind of realm of things. So what got you to this point? Um, so I uh, recently purchased a tablet, a Huon tablet, a Huon canvas tablet. And um, I decided to like um, just you know use Photoshop and, and uh, Illustrator. I was like, man, why don't I just you know go ahead and uh, do this? Because you know, I always you know I still dream of maybe one day doing my own comic book, my own uh, cartoon. So I just you know it was just the winter time and the winter break. So I just wanted to keep my uh, my creativity still flow you know flowing, not you know at a standstill. So I decided just to, you know, to draw. So I was like watching tutorials on YouTube, uh, Adobe, go Adobe sites and look at the tutorial. And once I felt confidence, I just took that tablet and just started drawing. That's and just, you know, playing around with different um, filters, with different layers, and just to see how this is gonna work out. What are you loving about this medium so far? What are your like pain points with it? I just, it feels so different, but also like 
your work is turning out equally like cool with equally like the same kind of values in it so I'm really curious what I like about it is that um if you make a mistake on make, <clears throat> you make a mistake you can erase it and go back compared to the real life you make mistakes you, you can go back but you have to paint over it or you're gonna have to take a sandpaper and erase it so I, I like that it, it, it's right there and you don't have to worry about you know going to the store to get some paint and all that everything that you need is right and the utensil, you just gotta know, um, you, you just gotta know where it is. Yeah. And where to find it. Mm -hmm. And what is, um, what is harder about this or what is less fun about the graphic design kind of part? Definitely, definitely the, um, what's hard about it is definitely practicing. Like there's so, there's, there is so much that you can do. Like it's a lot, it's a lot of stuff you can do. You can literally, uh, um create artwork that looks very realism that takes a lot of practice you can you know turn this from 2d to 3d you can turn this into animation like with different apps uh i can you know turn this into uh, like an animation you know i can just have it talking um you can uh have the background moving so it's 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 a lot to learn compared to um doing it with hands where you know you use different set of paper and you when you when you combine together you can make an animation compared to this you have to like pretty much play with it with the controls and all that yeah so it's pretty much like kind of like practice and mastering yeah i think it's amazing though how it does kind of bring you full circle to that comic book kind of aesthetic um and so exciting to be inching closer to maybe actualizing that childhood dream of having a comic book or um, a cartoon kind of series of adventures i'll be excited to stay tuned and see what this part of your work continues to um, become are these people characters real life people kind of random like are they gonna have more um, <laughs> fictional like the, the one on the left is me my, my self-portrait mm -hmm. and the one on the the one on the right uh, that's just a made up person. So cool. You can have a little bit of both um, in this new kind of world and arena for your art. So thank you for talking through those with me. Um, now I like to abstract a little bit more. Um, it was really fun to go through the specifics, but I want to understand more about kind of your big picture. Um, first kind of, you know, why does portraiture matter? What keeps inspiring you and motivating you to make portraits of new things, of real people, of fake, of not yet existing people, stuff like that? So the one thing about portraiture is, is that pretty much um, it's like, it's kind of like um, how you say it. I guess it's that it's that it's that mysterious uh, question. It, like when someone look at a portrait, that one question that pops in their mind is like, "Who this person is and why?" So it's like it's like it's like it's like that guessing game. And I think I like that that mystery. Like, why did this artist paint this person? And I, and it, it have the viewers asking that question. And like, like I said in the beginning, um, you know, it's just to send a message to the people that, you know, these people are just like you, you know, they're not, you know, they're, they're, you know may, there's something special about them, but they're just regular people just like you. I love that. I love the idea of the intrigue too and the mystery. And I think that that adds so much to a person's like sense of their self value too, that people are interested in their story. And so um, this like kind of platform that you create for people when you include them in a portrait, I think is a really special opportunity for whoever gets to be the subject. Um, what kind of, you know, lessons or pieces of wisdom have you collected so far in your journey that you um, wish that other people could hear that you would like to share? Um, learn from your trial and errors. Everyone's not perfect. Uh, it's okay to make mistakes. That's part of life. It's okay to fail in something. Uh, if you're alive, just learn from your mistakes and just keep going. And uh, surround yourself with people that will uh, motivate you, uh, that will tell you the truth, like, hey, you need to work on this and that. And just, you know, take that as a uh, how you say, it. take this as a grain of salt and just move on because we're not perfect and that's life, it's just getting better. 
Yeah, I can imagine all of that being super important in your current season of being in school and being stretched to the max, maybe mentally, like energy wise, like all the stuff is that, um, is that accurate? Or what is this current season, you know, challenging you to do or to how is definitely. it for you to show up? Definitely, definitely. Um, th like grad school is, is like is mastering. So you're mastering your technique, you're mastering, you're pretty much learning uh definitely how to write definitely uh doing research paper definitely doing a lot of reading not like you know these books with 10 or 20 pages you got books like 200 pages and you know you gotta read them as soon as you can so uh, it, it's, it's definitely a humble journey and i just hope that every day i just keep getting better yeah, that's amazing. And I think it's, um, I, I love how you described it as it is a time of mastering. And that's, you know, although it is heavy and like hard, it's so exciting. And it'll be so cool to look back at it <laughs> when, when you get through it. So keep showing up, uh, all of us. Um, as we wrap up, um, Rashawn, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and your work? And what are you really looking forward to right now? Uh, I want the people to know that anybody can be an artist. Uh, um, it's a it's a God given gift, but it's also it's something that you have to earn. I say not earn, but it's something you have to work towards too. And the more you work, to everybody have a God given gift, but you to make use of it, you have to practice. Like there will be times where you know you have to make a choice whether do you want to uh do leisure things such as play video games or go in the studio and work and, and practice and that's what's going to be the difference is making those hard-earned decisions and knowing that there's a award waiting for you when you accomplish that task it might not be you might not receive that award today might not receive it tomorrow or next month but one day you're going to receive it and you're going to be thankful that you made that decision where instead of you hanging you know you, you want to hang out with your friends or you want to um uh, do something leisure like play video games or uh, go hang out you chose to stay in that studio and it's gonna come in handy one day yeah I love that there is a world waiting for each of us that we can choose to embrace right if you choose to play the card or we hold the card and we <laughs> save it for a different day so it all kind of comes back to to the, the the themes that continue to motivate you and make your work really special and what are you looking forward to What's the world? Uh, definitely looking forward to uh, getting better. Also getting into more shows um, and just keep going from there. Keep going and from get, there. And, and, getting, and, getting, and getting more viewers and getting more people to follow my uh, social media page. Yes. Um, well, I will be shouting it from the rooftops. I'm so excited to have had this opportunity with you, Rashawn. I think you're doing really um, amazing things. And I look forward to being part of, you know, the fan group that gets to, to celebrate the journey from here. So thank you so much for being here. This has been so much fun. And thank you, Cara, for uh, letting me talk <laughs> and speak about my hard work. Absolutely.